I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about this fantastic film. Yes, yes, pleasure, pleasure. Um, maybe you could just kick off by giving us a brief introduction. Um, people who haven't seen this film before, what can they expect? Right, well, I am Dio Kenny. I play Shields Green in the movie Emperor. Emperor is a nickname of Shields Green. Um, and it's a movie that takes place pre the Civil War in America. And it centers around this individual who was a real live man who lived in South Carolina in the 1800s and made this heroin journey um, to freedom uh, in the North of America. And he had the chance to live as a free man, but instead he chose to partner up with John Brown. Uh, a vehement abolitionist um, to partake in a raid on Harper's Ferry where they wanted to uh, take over this arsenal and weaponize all the enslaved people around that area uh, to victory, um, which ultimately went south and went sour. But the incident in Harper's Ferry is, um, is heralded as the, the spark that led to the Civil War, that eventually led to the Civil War, which eventually led to the emancipation of Black people in America. So yes, that is our movie, Emperor, in a nutshell. Wow, great intro. And you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I read someone describe it as uh, Black Panther meets Birth of a Nation. You know, there's a well, lot going on in this, in this film. Yeah. Um, you know, there's obviously very tragic elements to it, but there's also... Yeah a real, you know, propulsion to the narrative, um, you know, this great kind of spirit um, that we see from your character. What was it that attracted to you um, about the script and being involved in the project? And I guess uncovering this history of, of this figure that, you know, hadn't, hasn't been represented on screen before. Right, um, a combination of things. Uh, there's Dio the actor, and then there's, there's Dio the film lover. Uh, Dio, the actor, initially didn't want to make this movie. Um, it's, it's, it sounds crazy, but um, I kind of felt like the slave narrative had been done. You know, I want to do more modern stories. You know, I, I want to change the face of Black people on the silver screen. And honestly, in retrospect, it was, it was a very ignorant position to take because Shields Green was a real person. So to say that is to say that his story doesn't deserve to be told. You know, so that's where Dio, the, 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 the film lover, or somebody who loves to watch film, um, kind of got it wrong, you know, and it's like, no, this story deserves to be told. Uh, we don't ever get tired of seeing World War II stories, you know, or Holocaust stories for, you know, uh, but for some reason, um, uh, African Americans, Black people in this country tend to get tired of those narratives. And I think the reason why is because of the perspective of the narrative, you know. Mm -hmm. Now we're delving into other things where, you know, you're talking about the white savior complex and things like that, but why Shields Green specifically, I was specifically interested in telling this story and, and what changed my mind was the script. And it was that, you know, he is going to be in charge of his own agency in the story. Um, true to life, you know, he, he, you know, led a one man rebellion against his plantation and freed himself and, and made this journey uh, to freedom by himself. Um, I've never seen any story like that before. And the filmmakers, Mark Ammon and Cami Winnikoff and the guys over at Sobini Films, they were interested in telling a, a road picture. And they weren't really interested in what we call torture porn, which is sadly what a lot of these um, uh, Civil War slave movies tend to be. It's just three hours of look how terrible life was on the plantation. But he wanted to take the story on the road and he wanted to, to he wanted to to paint a picture of how a person transforms from being enslaved to becoming a, a free man and then to becoming a myth those three things that happen um many many times in american history and he's picked shields green specifically because he's one of the heroes that fell through the cracks you know very few people knew about shields green i didn't know about shields green till i got this project and um, there are many, many, many stories uh, like Shields Green of individuals who took matters into their own hands and chose to fight back. And, um, you know, whether, whether or not it led to their demise or they were martyred because of it, um, um, they did take agency of their lives. And as a, a black actor, I wanna tell stories like that, stories where we are in control of our own narratives 
And, and that's what drew me to Shields Green. And then Mark also wanted to have fun with it. You know, he, he grew up watching Westerns and, you know, it's funny because the Western in America is almost like Hollywood's idea of washing that part of history because the Western and the slave narrative took place at the same time. You know, so it's like uh, they're not two different worlds, they're the same worlds. And it's almost how the South remembers history and the North remembers history, you know. So he wants to bring those, he wanted to bring those two worlds together and explore this man's life through, you know, a fast, fast paced, fugitive um, uh, Western slash Civil War picture. So I was like, sign me up, I'm down for that. I think that's so true. That, uh, that's what makes the, the film quite unique that it does have quite a contrast to a lot of the other slave narrative films. Uh, and, you know, I was watching it and I was like, well, this gives kind of a sort of contemporary set action film, a real run for its money, you know, <laughs> the sort of high speed chases, gunfights, there's explosions, um, you know, so what was it like, I guess, kind of just from like a really physical aspect of having to kind of act, you know, out, you know, some of these really intense scenes, but yeah. also having to do it in, you know, a different era, thinking about the costumes and, you know, yes. all the kind of like set specifics that you would have to have navigated. So what was that experience? Yeah. Um, for me, I just said, Mark, I'm going to leave all the action stuff to you. You know, I, I'm, I'm a boring theater actor. You know, I'm, I'm a nerd about my craft. So I just went into a hole and it's research, research, research um, about everything. And for me, if you just stay as true to possible, for the character out of that will come all the action type stuff. So for me, it was just about finding every bit of scrap of information there is out there about Shields Green, which is very limited. I mean, there's interviews that were done during his trial um, after, you know, a week later after he was apprehended post the failure of Harper's Ferry. Um, and then uh, Frederick Douglass wrote about him very sparringly in his autobiographies as well. So you just take that thread and then just try to unravel who you think this man would have been. There are no records of him from his plantation or his plantation owner. He's believed to have been married with a son, but no records of the son or where what happened to him afterwards. So my whole thing was just to focus on Shields specifically and based off of the information from Frederick Douglass's book where he spoke about Shields and said, you know, he, you know, he was a sing he, he, he was a man of, um, that didn't shrink to hardship. He spoke very deliberately and, but in a very broken up pattern. Um, you start to say, why, 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 what, what gave this man such confidence and why did he speak the way he, you know, he, he spoke. And a lot of that research for me came from doing psychological research really as to what are the effects of trauma on a, on a human being, you know, childhood trauma specifically because Shields would have been born into slavery. So you start figuring things out like, you know, eye contact, you know, Mark and I were like, you know, the first 30 pages of this movie, we don't want Shields making direct eye contact with his overlords um, because that's a, a very common trait characteristic of a childhood trauma. And then with the voice, you know, Frederick Douglass, he spoke very slowly in a broken up pattern, trying to recreate that as an effect of him maybe having a stutter from a childhood because that's also a common trait of, of uh, abuse. So he would, to, to counter that, he would speak very slowly and very deliberately to hide some kind of a stutter or speech impediment of some kind. So we worked on things like that. And then the physicality of the movie was just me reading the book and going, and sorry, the script thing saying, oh, wow. Uh, from page one to page 110, he's running. He's just <laughs> running the whole time. So I got to get my cardio up. Um, so yeah, just really went on a, a very intensive cardio plan uh, with one of my best friends who happens to be a personal trainer. He put me on a diet and I just literally started running like five miles every other day, eventually got up to about eight miles a day. And then right before filming, I was doing close to half a marathon, 12 miles a day. So, which obviously I lost a lot of weight doing that. I usually carry myself around 180 pounds. I got down to 162 for filming. That was another conversation Mark and I had because initially I wanted to get bigger. I was like, I just want to be the biggest, you know, vanity. Oh God. But Mark <laughs> was like, nope, um, he wouldn't have been a superhero. He would have been very gaunt, very lean. We looked at what was possibly the slave's diet based off of their workload and, and what that would do to the body. So we went for more of a soccer player's body 
was the physique that we wanted him to have and um which I thought worked very very well and then that just changes everything about you when you, you it changes the way you walk it changes the way you carry yourself and then we wanted him to blossom as the movie went on so if you watch it closely initially he he kind of hunches over a little bit and doesn't make too much eye contact but by the end of the movie he's he's become a new man you know he's opened up a little bit and and um so we wanted to show that transformation over the course of the story um yeah so it's just little minor things like that and then hair and my the hair and costume department and makeup I, I just have to give them all the credit in the world because when they put you in that wardrobe it just it changes everything it changes everything and there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know you know we spoke I'm sorry if I'm talking too much but I just get really passionate no, about please. this like um uh we with with the wardrobe department um the research that they gave me which is counter to what people would think would be that oh you know slaves i hate saying slaves enslaved people um were robbed of their identity and because of that they were just automatons and they were just these people that just you know worked to the bone every single day and never didn't really have a sense of self or a sense of who they were and that's not true that's not true at all quite the contrary you know um from the research that we did desperation breeds ingenuity it breeds people to be able to show off their identity in different ways in more subtle ways and so in the wardrobe how they dyed their clothing using flowers for dye or using ox blood to to introduce color into their wardrobe all these little things that ended up being very subtle detail that the audience would never see, but we knew about that stuff within our wardrobe was everything, you know, another thing would be like jewelry. You know, I remember having this idea for Sarah, um, Natori Norton, who plays my wife, she has this bracelet that I ended up carrying over the course of the film. And there was a there was a big pushback because we're like, was that accurate? Would they have had money to buy jewelry? And it's like, no, they wouldn't have had money to buy jewelry. He would have built that. He would have made that with his hands for his wife. So those little things start to really inform character and really inform what what matters to these people, you know, and you just and then I'm just I'm a very spiritual person. So some days after you've done all that preparation and all that history and the wardrobe and the voice, you know, trying to get my voice like several octaves deeper and speaking with this Gullah accent. I just prayed. I got on my knees and just prayed, God, just give me inspiration. Like literally, I seek inspiration from everywhere. You know, so it's just like, please, like Shields, if you're out there, just come into me, just inhabit my body and just create something. Um, yeah, actors, we often just pray for inspiration, just from the ether, you know? So yeah, that's kind of, that was kind of my Frankenstein process into getting this role and playing the role, yeah. Was there a most challenging scene? I'm just thinking, you know, holding a breath underwater. Did you really have that snake going across you? I would have freaked out if you did. You know, like Listen, was that really hardest bit. Yeah, there's so much I had to do in this film. Uh, obviously, getting in shape was was tough. I'd never ridden a horse before, and uh, had to learn how to ride a horse. I went to J New Jersey two months before we started filming. I was riding like three, four times a week. So I eventually learned how to ride a horse, all, all this crazy stuff, how to load an old gun, shoot an old gun. The mosquitoes in Savannah, Georgia, in the sweltering heat. But nothing compares to having a snake crawl over you. I have the biggest phobia for snakes <laughs> on earth. And I and here's the thing, I had auditioned for the movie, I had tested all this crazy stuff, I read the script, I saw it in the script, but it didn't quite register that a day will come where I have to, I'll let's look at the call sheet, and it says, snake crawls over Dio, right? And eventually when I got the role, I was like, oh my God, I have to actually shoot this scene. And like the producers try to give me outs many times, They're like, look, we'll have, we'll have a real snake, but we'll have the fake snake, you know, so... But I was just like, man, I can't use the fake snake. You know, when award season comes along, they're gonna give me award <laughs> to the guy who used the real snake, all right? So, so I mean, it was it was it was terrifying. I mean, I remember calling my girlfriend like the day of the scene, just going, I I I don't think I can do this. I tell you a funny story. You seen Private Ryan, Saving Private Ryan? Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the movie. The opening of that film, right? It's the storm on Normandy, 
and it's Tom Hanks. He's coming off the boat and it's chaos and like everything goes silent, right? It's like the white noise sound. And it's, you can hear the explosions almost like you're underwater. I got to set. They said, Dyer, we're going to show you the snake. And then, uh, you know, just to familiarize you with the snake, there's a wrangler right here. I met the guy, shook his hand. They took me to the back. They opened the tub. And it was the biggest snake I'd ever seen in my life. And I tell you, I went deaf. That is not a joke. <laughs> that is real. The blood flowed to my ears. And he was talking to me. And I'm going, mm -hmm. But all I'm hearing is wah, 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 wah. I couldn't hear a thing. I shake his hand. I go back to my trailer, sweat, just a sweat. I still can't tell you how I shot that scene. I still cannot tell you how I shot that scene. The very first take, because another thing is we're in the middle of Savannah, Georgia, and it's there's gnats and critters, all kinds of crazy stuff. So we're spraying off spray on our bodies to insect repellent which we didn't know, but snakes don't like that as well. So for the take, we wanted the snake to crawl over me. <laughs> the very first take, the snake comes to me, right? Taps my shoulder, doesn't go over, it goes around this way. <laughs> and like, I could feel like its tongue, like lick my sideburns. And I tell you, my soul left my body oh, for my like, <laughs> for a good 10 minutes. I, and I looked down on my body and said, wow, this is how I die. I died in the middle of making my my first lead movie amazing that's a this bit that's that's a pretty good way to go out right um but after like take one or take two we eventually had to change my wardrobe to one where i hadn't sprayed all that stuff on me so we eventually got the snake to go over but i literally overcame that phobia on that movie by like take five i was like like this with the snake which i pr prior to that i could never do i mean that was the hardest leading up to that day was just a nightmare, just a nightmare. But um, wow, I, it's it's my most proudest moment in my life. <laughs> not not pooping my pants while filming that <laughs> shot. Um, yeah, wow. so that was tough. That was that's, hard. That's, that's the way to cure, cure a phobia. Then just like go straight for head yeah, head yeah. Okay. Somebody can. They paid me. They paid me to overcome my phobia. <laughs> I'll put it to you that way. Yeah. So that was that was amazing, but tough. tough. And I guess on a more serious note, you know, yeah. last year so much went on i mean not least the pandemic but thinking yeah. of you know the resurgence of black lives matter in the wake of the george floyd killing you know trump losing at the election do you think there's this moment in time you know there's a particular resonance to going back and revisiting history particularly um from a black perspective and mm -hmm. why do you think it's important to still keep telling these stories, representing these stories, and how can that play into, you know, our contemporary time and I guess contemporary race relations in, in the US? Absolutely. Um, I almost have a threefold answer to that and I'll try to really keep it short because I get very passionate about this. But when we shot this movie, we shot this movie in 2018 actually. Mm -hmm. So we shot it way before, um, you know, the state of emergency of 2020 that happened in America. And when we made the movie, I think our intentions were pure. We just wanted to tell a fun movie about um, something that actually happened in a real individual. And, um, you know, obviously we took a lot of creative liberties. You know, we wanted it to be an accessible film. We didn't necessarily want to tell a history lesson, but we, we, we felt his story deserved to be told. And that's why we were making it. And it just so happened that when it did come out, it came out in the middle of, you know, America really coming to a reckoning. And I think the reason why America kind of is where it is is because the, it hasn't fully embraced its own history, mm. you know, and they're, they're quite literally two factions of Americans that have different ideas of what happened specifically during the Civil War and here and thereafter, you know, uh, the Reconstruction period to be more specific, where I feel America should have really put a stamp on this is our history this is what happened you know the the, the generals and the leaders that, that that you know we fought against during the civil war they need to be consequences they need to be punished but that never happened it's so funny a lot of those generals ended up being invited into the senate almost in, the, in a show of goodwill you know we're just going to wipe the state clean every you know and keep the country together and i think that was in at the time it made sense, but in retrospect, it, it was a mistake because those same leaders, right, that were fighting for slavery were, were 
you, you know, be, became martyrs in the South. You know, they, be, they were romanticized and this, it, which created this false narrative of like the great, you know, the great war in the South. And, you know, oh, it wasn't for slavery. We were fighting for something else. And that wasn't true. And, but that ideology has kept on till today. And so America has a fragmented understanding of history. And that's why stories like this need to be told to remind people the Civil War was 100% because of slavery. It was a way of life. It was, it was, it was more than a way of life. It was people's fortunes. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, a lot of individuals had to create weird narratives that human beings were three black people were three fourths of a human being in order to justify their business. Nobody wants to sell slaves. You know, they want to sell cattle. So you create all these weird narratives to justify why you're doing what you're doing. And I and I think, you know. There are people today who still don't believe that as the truth of that history. So that's why stories like that need to be told. Not because it's the cool thing and you're you're making a movie that's touching the zeitgeist. We didn't, we couldn't predict the things that happened. But you know, the timing was just it's a spiritual timing. We couldn't have we couldn't have done it any better, you know. And and um I think it just is one of those things where we just want people to know their history specifically and to not shy away from it, to look it dead in the eye. And out of that to have some kind of a cathartic experience. You know, we don't want to create something that makes people angry. Yes, when you when you remember this history of America, it makes you angry. But it, it shouldn't make you angry and radicalize you to not want to collaborate with people. You know, ultimately Shields Green collaborated with John Brown. You know, I, I always tell people it's like one of the earliest collaborations across races to, to try to achieve something in America. You know what I mean? So um, I, I ultimately want people to watch this movie um, coming from the year that we've had in 2020 and to just on, on, honestly to to realize our history and to realize that um, we just need to be more tolerant with each other. You know, we just need to be more accepting. And um, that's, that's the only way we can get through this thing in one piece, you know, accept the history. It's not your fault. It's your ancestors fault, you know, speaking specifically to white folks or people who are descendant of slave owners. You know, I think there's a, there's a guilt that I think they feel sometimes, and it's really not about you. Like, don't, remove yourself from that guilt you know it's not about you it's about your ancestor but you can you can undo some of the the real deep traumas that have been caused for over 400 years i mean slavery slavery lasted longer than you know between the emancipation proclamation and now is shorter than the 400 years of slavery you know you don't just wake up one day and be liberated you know, and then there's obviously all these different eras, the Jim Crow era, the civil rights movement, you know, police brutality, you know, mass incarceration. It's, there have been so many different systems of this cancer of, of racism trying desperately to, to linger on, almost like the villain in a horror movie that just won't die. But, you know, you, you can't take a day off. You can't take a day off with it. So making movies like this, talking about it, keeping it at the forefront of conversations and, and then you just doing your own part as an individual in your own life to to undo some of these, you know, antiquated ways of thinking. They they all go hand in hand. And I just hope this movie is a small part of that change in the world. Yes. You know. Yeah. And do you feel that there is that we are at a bit of a turning point in some senses in kind of what's yes. going on societally, but also, you know, on screen, like are we seeing more and more um, varied representations, you know, who can tell stories, who's in front and behind the camera. Um, you know, there is a lot more diversity. Is it going in the right direction? Do you have optimism for the future? I do. I, first of all, just in life in general, I'm an optimist <laughs> through and through. It's it's disgusting. And I know it, it turns, it's probably off-putting to some people, but I, I'm just, I'm extremely optimistic about life. And I'm, I, I am extremely optimistic about the trajectory that we're going in. You know, the world is the world is definitely a more tolerant and a more accepting place than it was even 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, to, to, to say otherwise would be an absolute falsehood. Can it be better? Yes, it can be better. You know, so the idea is to keep treading, trending in the direction that we're going in. Um, but yeah, I definitely see 
a lot of change. You know, listen, two, two of my contemporaries, you know, John Boyega and Daniel Kaluuya just won a Golden Globe last night. Like, what the heck? Like, you know, so it's, yes, it, it's getting better. A woman just won, you know, best director for the Golden Globes last night. You know what I mean? And um, now the, the Hollywood foreign press not having that much diversity, we can win there. You know, we can, that can become better. But it's, it's, it's baby steps. It's baby steps. Um, but the idea is never to get too comfortable, to always fight for inclusivity when it is appropriate and not to force it. Um, because that's another conversation that I could also have an hour long session about um, where they're just some stories that they're just not appropriate for black folks to be in that arena, you know, no matter how much you want diversity. But um, but in general, yes, to, to have representation in front of the camera, behind the camera, I think it is trending in a, in, in a good direction. I think it's only going to get better so long as people are conscious of it. You have to remain conscious of it. And speaking of the Golden Globes, you know, there was kind of the celebration of Chadwick Boseman and there's been yeah. so much, you know, about his career. And he took on a lot of roles, um, yeah. you know, uh, giving airtime to black history, black historical figures. You know, what does kind of symbol was he for the black community and black actors? And, you know, and, and why is it so important to celebrate actors like him? Yeah, listen, I, Chadwick is the gold standard, period. He's just, the, I remember, listen, I, I, a lot of people don't know this story. I'll give you an exclusive. <laughs> this is years ago. I, I just come off of the Hunger Games and the biggest movie, first movie and the biggest movie of my life. And I, I get a call that, oh, Universal is doing this movie. It's called 42. And they want you to come in and read for it. And I went and I, I read for that movie four times. And I had a final read with Brian Helgeland and to play Chadwick. And it got to, to play Jackie Robinson. And it got down to, I'm pretty sure it was either me and him or like three other people. It was like a very small amount of people. And Chadwick got it. And of course, I'm like, oh gutted like and I'm like who is this guy you know and then he just proceeded from year to year to just get every single role you know and you're, you're so you you as an actor obviously you you love film but you're also like oh man I wish it was me you know a little bit of jealousy but when you get to know him and when you get to know one his work ethic and two his dedication to his craft and the way he picked projects and how he wanted to, 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 how he wanted to communicate the black experience to the rest of the world on screen with dignity and with attention to detail and specificity. And tragically, the short life that he lived, he was absolutely destined to get all those roles. Because I feel like I probably that early in my career would have taken it for granted and wasn't prepared and wasn't locked in, you know, and and he was a lot older than I was. So he had lived some life, you know, sometimes you have to live some life to, I think when he got, when he played that role, he was like in his late thirties where I was 23 years old. Like, what do I know about, you know, life really at that age? So, you know, he, I always looked at him and obviously years later I met him and we laughed about it and joked about how he, you know, used to <laughs> beat me out of every single role, <laughs> but he was really like a big brother, just really like somebody who was like, just the he was like the he was like the gold at the end of the rainbow you know what i'm saying he was like the 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 north star the true like he he just led he led so far ahead of the group and he was such a pathway to what it what it could look like to have such a successful curated career mm. you know and 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 also at such a relatively young age, you know, our, our heroes from the past, whether it was Sidney Portier or Denzel Washington or Will Smith, like they were a lot older. But mm -hmm. like Chadwick was like our contemporary, and he was and he was killing it. He was doing it in such an amazing way. And so everybody was trying to not copy his career, but emulate his career, emulate his bold choices, the way he said no to certain things, and the way he was all in one hundred percent to some other things. And so, yeah, his legacy, uh, it, unbeaten. It'll be unbeaten for years and unmatched, you know? So I I, I give up trying. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, there's just some people like who are so excellent and, and so executed on, at a high level. You just put them on the top shelf and you just continue on your tiny little journey, unmatched. 
Chadwick is unmatched, period. You know, greatest of all time. He's a GOAT. You know, the rest of us, we're just, we're just here. We're just happy to be here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're just happy to be around. But um, yeah, I, I, I seriously look up to him in yeah. so many ways. And it's so tragic that he's gone because yeah. I feel like he was just getting started, man. Yeah. I really, really do. I really, really do. But, you know, to each his own, everything happens for a reason. And it was his time. But yeah. And you can't say that guy didn't live a full life. He gave his all till the very end. Yeah. My God, that's admirable beyond belief. Yeah. And I'm gone over my time, but just one final question. <laughs> you know, talking about your career trajectory, you know, you <laughs> grew up in Nigeria, if I'm, if I'm right. And, you know, yes. you had had these roles in Hunger Games and Terminator Genesis and, and now Emperor. Mm. Where do you see yourself going? Do you already have things in the pipeline? And, you know, do you have directors you'd love to work with or other actors? Like, where do your ambitions Oh, my lie? God. First of all, you're my last interview for the day, so we can go as long as possible. <laughs> okay. I, oh, my goodness. I, I'm such a cinephile. I watch everything. I love everything. I, fiction, nonfiction drama, science fiction, comedy. I literally love everything. So ultimately I want a very varied career. I want to do different things. I love big movies. I love small movies. And, um, and oh my God, I want my, the list of directors I want to work with is so ridiculous. I want to work with them all. I, Wes Anderson, uh, David Fincher, Ryan Coogler, Ava DuVernay. I could go on and on and on. JJ Abrams, I love them all. I want to collect them all, <laughs> but, um, but yes, uh, last year and this year have been amazing. I did a movie last year. The only one I can talk about is queen pins with, uh, Paul Hauser and, and Kristen Bell. And, um, and yeah, that should come out either later this year or next year. And it's a really fun movie. Um, it's based off a true story about these two women. They're it's called Queen Pins, but they're two women from Arizona that had like a, um, they started a uh, illegal coupon business and became like billionaires doing it. So it's like this, it's like a comedy, a black comedy kind of, because it's mm. based off of reality and the stakes are real, but in tone, it's a little bit funny, almost like I, Tanya, mm, that kind of a tone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that was a really fun one we shot at the end of last year. And then I shot another movie earlier this year. My publicist literally, literally told me this morning, you can't talk about it, even oh. though you, I've rapped on the movie, um, but the press hasn't, it hasn't hit the press yet, but just shot a movie early this year that I'm really, really excited about. Um, I'm currently on a TV show that I can't talk about. I'm in Toronto right now. Can't talk about this one. And then when I leave this movie, I go to Greece to shoot another movie. It's a Disney movie, but I can't say anything other than that. So, sorry. <laughs> But yeah, this year has been such a blessing and so incredible. And eventually when all this stuff hits the press, I'd love to come back again and actually talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just want to keep doing great work and, and working with people that I'm excited to work with and telling stories that are touching and playing complex characters and not caricatures. And, and um, yeah, I just, I love making films and I love watching films, you know, mm -hmm. and I pinch myself every day that I get to do this job. Mm. It's freaking incredible. I'm not gonna lie, or play it cool. I'm geeked every day. <laughs> so yeah. Would you ever go back to Nigeria and do a film? Is it is it Nollywood? Oh Did my just make god! That up? I, that I first of all, I go back to Nigeria. Well, other than COVID era, I go back to Nigeria every year. Every Christmas, I'm back in Nigeria. I still have a lot of family back there. Last year was the first year I didn't go back in like a decade. Um, and yeah, I. I it's so funny. They, they people just think I will. I will say no. So like they just don't offer me stuff. I would do a Nigerian movie. I keep putting. I will put this out there. I will do a Nigerian movie. I had a meeting with Netflix uh, last year. Um, they're they they're want to get really involved in making Nigerian movies. Oh, and I told them, I was like, I will do it. I will. I don't know why people never, they just think, oh, die, he's too busy doing like Hollywood movies. I'm like, no, I would do a Nigerian movie in a heartbeat if the script was good and the director was good and it was something I was excited about, I would. So please send the offers. We are receiving them. <laughs> Great, yeah. hopefully someone will pick that up. Um, yes. Well, yeah, I better wrap up now, but thank you so much for sharing all that with me. It was so lovely to chat to you and um, best of luck with those next projects. Can't wait to see all those as well. And yeah, Absolutely. hopefully people can check out the film. I think it's out today um, in the UK. So thanks so yes. much for your time. Thank you very much.